We all know that relationships take a lot of work. Throw in building a business and it can get real messy. So how do you navigate it? Hi, I'm Kayla Swanson and I am your host of the Profitable Salon Owner Podcast. And hanging out with me today is Jason Everett. What's up, Jason? What up? I'm excited to be here. We're going to talk about some good stuff today. Roll up your sleeves. Let's do it. I'm excited. Yeah. When I was thinking of, we had a question come in um, about building like partnerships, but business relationships, things like that. And I was like, who better to have on to talk about this than somebody who's had dozens of partners <laughs> or business partners and Let's relationships clear. and business building all partners. that. Yes, that's a weird yeah. way to say that. But yes, <laughs> yeah. um, business partners. I have. I've had good partners. I've had bad partners and everything in between. And you know, even the best partnerships don't you know do do everything perfectly. So I think you got to figure out what are the lessons and how do you grow from it. I think it's a really big deal. Yeah. Yeah. So I love like, I mean, because building any relationship with any two people is never the same. Mm -hmm. And so I think that like, there's so much advice out there of how to build relationships and how to, you know, you can get pick up your phone, you can get really advice anywhere. But I think there's also a lot of bad advice on how to build relationships, especially when it comes to business. So what are some like key important parts as you start to like think about you and have a business partner, even shareholders and having partners with people that you're in business with? What are some really key components to that? Yeah. So one of the things I want to start with, and and by the way, uh, this question has come up a lot because, you know, uh, Doug Campbell and I is business partner for High Performance Salon Academy. Obviously, he's on the podcast a lot. But, um, you know, he and I have been in partnership for, I think, almost 10 years now. And it's not perfect by any means. I mean, we definitely argue and then get along and then argue. And <laughs> But he just texted me. I, you know, I just literally got this message again. And I'll, I'll read it to you because he just texted me. This is very cute. I don't share this stuff publicly. But, like, he just said, hey, great class, man. We really do make great music together. Like, you know, he just texted me that this morning. So we had a really good class. It went well. And, like, sometimes we're on fire. And I think that's that's what you want is you want to have a partner that, like, one plus one equals five instead of one plus one equals two. And that's kind of yeah. the thing. So I get asked about partnerships a lot. And I, you know, we kind of jokingly said dozens of partnerships. I I have had a lot of people that I wanted to try and see about being a business with. I am a Mm -hmm. together is better person in general. Like there's a reason why I'm married. I believe that two people uh, can do really cool things when put in the same place. And even if you've tried it and it didn't work, like all good. But I I always have felt like business partnerships were a good part of it. And I I don't really like rock and solo, just being honest. Like if it was like, hey, do I want to go to a movie by myself or with somebody else? I want to go with somebody else because I feel like life is better with other people. Now, totally. take that into a business relationship or a marriage. It's basically business marriage on some level. I mean, we're joking about that. Is that you're saying like, well, what is the plan? How long are we planning to be together? What do we want to do? What's the outcome that we're after? Because when you get married in real life, you know, the goal is to try and stay married forever. That, that'd be part of the goal. But in business, sure. usually it's like, hey, we're going to have a marriage for a certain amount of time, maybe till we get a certain level or maybe we'll, we'll sell it at some point. Maybe we'll, we'll do this forever. But a lot of business partners go in and just be like, hey, I like working with you. I don't want to pay you. You don't want to pay me. Let's just just do this together. And it's kind of like this opportunity where people say, um, you know, I want to do business. I don't want to do it by myself. So I'd rather do it with anybody and we get along. And I think that's the most dangerous one I could possibly tell you is the like, yeah. hey, we get along decent. We should have a business together. I don't think that's a good way to do it. Yeah. I get that because then you because you just go into you like somebody because as in flows like I've heard somebody told me one time like go through every season of life like every like like a whole year of life with somebody before you make any major choices with them because you don't know how they are they may like you know like they're, they're always the honeymoon phase and there's totally, always a time totally. where you're like things are going really great let's do this and that's a really good point to make yeah. it's like don't just jump into something because of your feelings. so let me talk about some business partnerships that did and didn't work out um, and by the way like I said I've been in and out of a bunch of different partnerships not not because I'm schizo or anything weird just because I learned a lot through partnerships and I think I couldn't have my partnership I have now without the other experience I had so very first business partner and and by the way my parents own business together and they are their own business partners and that's husband wife business partners are very different than like friends we call them like uh Mm -hmm. in the salon world we call them salon spouses like two women that are like hey we're gonna have a business together two men that are like we're gonna start a barbershop or whatever together like they're just different things and so and business spouses are still partnerships you know versus having two people who uh don't also share a home together but then also have a business partner different thing okay Different so my thing. very first partnership was a guy named Leo Bodea. Leo was my roommate. And this was when we were, I was like 19 years old. Leo and I were roommates and we wanted to start a business and we wanted to start a scooter company, electric scooter company way back in the day. New stories, Kayla, new story. No um, kidding. I was like, wow. I'm we wanted to start one. like before bird oh, scooters. Way before like, bird scooters. Before. I'm talking, this is. You had the original oh, idea. Well, I don't know that I had the original idea, but, <laughs> but we were at a place and we saw these guys selling electric scooters and they were like, Hey, um, if you want to buy in, it's like $1,500 to buy in 
to buy your first batch of electric scooters. And both him and I were like, that sounds really cool. We'd love to run an electric scooter company. And this was, by the way, in like 2000, 2001. This is a long time ago. Back okay, in the day. Back in the day. So yeah, that's very early before like bird scooters and all this stuff. And all those things. I was like eight. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> so anyway, so it was like, hey, it's 1500 bucks. And I was basically like, man, 1500 bucks is a lot. How about I put up half, you put up half, and congratulations, we'll own a business together. Cute. That's how most people do it. And I, I want, I'm telling you this very basic story because – it's like that's how most people do it. They're like, it's really expensive and it's a lot of risk. If I put somebody else in, well, somebody else will do some work. Somebody else will put up some money and like, cool, we're in. And congratulations, my first 50 50 partnership was born, right? He put up half, I put up half, we have this business. So within a very short period of time, um, we get our first couple scooters and we do a couple things and we go to a, 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 we go to some events and we do some things and like, I start uh, selling more scooters than my business partner, argument number one, right? Because like I'm the one doing all the sales. He's helping, but he's like the setup guy and he's not selling any scooters. I'm like, bro. Yeah, and we kept buying more scooters. I'm like, bro, you got to get your act together. Like I'm out selling the scooters. And he's like, oh, I know. I just, I don't know how to sell like you do. I'm like, okay, well, what else can you do? And he's like, I don't know. Maybe I'll, I'll build a website. So then cool. He built a website and like we never sold any scooters to the website. This was in again, 2001. But like at least we kind of had some stuff going. And then um, same thing is like, I started doing all the branding and I had friends who did branding. I had friends who did all this and da, da, da. Anyway, we ended up closing that business uh, within, within a month or two. We only had it for a couple months and we sold some scooters and it was, it was very, there was a very high liability because people were riding around on things and falling. This kid fell, smacked his head and got stitches. We thought we we're going to get sued and be shut down forever. And um, oh, no. we were like, this is a very dangerous business. We should not be doing this business. Right. Again, a couple, couple kids, I'm 20 years old or whatever. And we're like, Had a good idea. yeah. And we're like, this is probably not the best. So we shut it down. But, but the first argument started developing of like, who's doing more work? And by the way, number one argument of 50, 50 business owners, who does more work, right? And you know, and by the way, everybody thinks they do more work, no matter what side you're on of the 50, 50, For everybody sure. thinks they always do more work. So I went forward and started a whole bunch of other businesses. I had an app development company. I had a cold weather clothing brand. I had all this other stuff. And almost every time I said, let's do 50, 50 partnerships who we were all put up half, they put up half and we did all these other things. Um, it wasn't until I started getting into partnerships that I said, hey, I'll do this partnership, but you can have a smaller percent than 50 that I started having more success in partnerships. And mm -hmm. um, it was because I just was like, look, I know what I'm worth, what I bring, what I do, et cetera. And like then all of a sudden partnerships started becoming a little bit more different, more different, more mo better. More but different. like the, yeah, they started <laughs> becoming better. different because it was like, OK, well, now. I'm clear on what, who brings what to the table and how it works. And I also started getting clear about defining roles and what happens and who does what and what happens. And so mm -hmm. that's when it all of a sudden it started being really good. I will just tell you, I have helped more people try and exit 50, 50 partnerships because they thought we're both just work hard and that's enough. And a lot of people that are probably listening are like, damn it, I'm in a 50, 50 partnership. And I think I outwork my partner. So it, I can't really help you if you're already in it. I just can help you if you've ever considered bringing on partnerships, which is why you mentioned about shareholders and bringing on other people. Uh, and I want to talk about that maybe after the break. But like, I think those are some things to really consider is like what you can do. And I think sometimes it's really important to say who brings what to the table and do you feel like those people are doing that? And I would just say a lot of the partners that I know that have stuck together are people who are not in 50-50. It doesn't mean you can't make it, but that's a big part of it is understand like at some point, even if it's only 51-49, that you have a tiebreaker, that somebody's mm -hmm. actually in charge, that somebody has the final say. So if that you're like, I don't agree, and I don't agree, you're like, cool, I'm the tiebreaker, so we're going forward. Like that, that's yeah. a really important yeah. thing. And I, I'd like to talk about some foundations of like what else makes a partnership besides that. But I think that's a good place totally. to just pause for a second. One person has to make the final decision, which I love that you just said that. So reiterating that. But what would be, yeah, like in the foundations of that, when you're finding that person, like in personalities, like there's a lot, there's really a lot that goes into finding somebody who works well because yeah, you have a lot of experience in finding out what are the other person's experience, what are they good at, and how does that start to balance out? How do you start to have those conversations? I'd also love to know, like, is do you is it important to have somebody else come into it? in order to build like have the conversation of who gets what yeah so so let me tell you my partnership warning this is my partnership warning i've given yes. that, that is, actually that. i've had people message me three years later and tell me thank you for that advice and i've had people message me later and sit three years later and say i didn't listen to your advice and that was messed up <laughs> so so i'm going to give you this piece of advice don't ever bring on a partner because you don't have enough money to pay an employee hmm. this is a really big deal especially for businesses they're like, well, I need to have a manager for my salon, 
and the manager at the salon I'm at right now is pretty good. Maybe I'll make them a partner. Then that, that way I don't have to pay them. That's one of the worst kisses of death that happens. And people, people usually bring on partners when they are like, I don't have enough money to pay that person. So I'm going to make them a partner. And they kind of give away equity in exchange for not paying somebody. And that's one of the most dangerous ones that you will be bitter about. You will be angry about. You will be grumpy about for the remainder of that experience with your business partner. Because at some point, in the business, especially when it's be become successful, at some point they'll be out earning the salary that you should have paid them in the day. And then you're mad that you should have just hired them as a salary position. Um, and I think that's where a lot of people end up uh, getting stuck in partnerships that they don't want to be in is they should have just paid somebody for the knowledge and advice they had. They just didn't have the money. So they gave away an equity. Um, a lot of big companies though, do do that. They just give it away in a much smaller percentage, like uh, SaaS companies, software companies. They're like, Oh, we'll give you a percent because they're it, they're planning to grow to some bajillions of dollars and they're they're like, For here, sure. take your stock interest. Like that's a little bit different <laughs> when Mark Zuckerberg was like, I'll pay some employees. Like I'll pay but what he did, interestingly, and a lot of those companies are like, we're gonna give you a salary and some stock options so that when the event is that we sell, we know why you're invest you're not making the money that you are you should be making, but you're also getting stock options and people kind of bank on that exploding. But that's different than just saying, I want somebody else who also is not going to work for a paycheck. They work for free. That's when you get into trauma mm -hmm. with your partnership. So that's, that's one of my warnings, I would just say. So when you evaluate your partnership right now or your, your, your interest in a partnership, you got to ask yourself, should I just be paying this person for what they do uh, instead of offering them an ownership percentage? Like kind of asking like, why do you – like, yeah, why? What's your what's your reasons completely behind why you're wanting a partnership? Like asking that question and making sure you're not just bringing them on because you don't want to pay them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I think that's a really big deal. So why is it that uh, Doug and I have worked out as really good as partners? I think that's another really good framework for you is that um, first of all, when Doug and I got together um, – we, he was a client first. So I was, I was his coach for about a year and a half. I think something like that year and a half, something like that, where um, I coached him. I coached his wife. I coached his family, his managers for the business. Like I coached them for about a year and a half. And um, I set up and established like, Hey, here's the ground rules for how this works. What's going on? Like what you do. And I was able to get them very good success. And they had a lot of growth, really reshaped their organization as a salon. And, um, and I was like, oh, he operates very differently at a high level of integrity. And we had some very strong matching belief systems, meaning mm. that um, our belief in how we ran businesses were together, the integrity was together. And I liked brainstorming with him. And I'm like, hey, man, when we talk about stuff, we actually get very productive. And interestingly, if you don't know this, Kayla, I don't even know if you know, but like when he and I became partners, I actually had three other business partners at the exact same time when I worked with him for oh, three man. other companies. I don't know if you, did you oh, know that? Man. You didn't no, know I that? did not know that. So I started three other companies. We started the Academy. I started something called uh, the Video Rockstar Academy. I also started um, Marketing Refuel, which was a an agency. Um, and then I also had, um, within a very short period of time, I started Tundra Gear, which is a cold weather clothing brand. Each one of those had partnerships. Wow. So Doug was one of four partners that I had. That's, so that's I was a doing lot a lot. Of, that's a lot of relationships. And I was like, to hey, I'm going to do a partnership here and a partnership there and a partnership there and a partnership there. And, and every other partnership failed because at some point that partner let me down, just being really honest. Like at some point mm -hmm. that partner wasn't pulling their weight, didn't want to do what they were doing. And every time I worked with Doug, like great things kept happening. So like a company grew and we grew and grew and grew. And then eventually that the high performance became bigger than everything else that I ran. And I'm like, all right, this is what we're doing. Like it just became the bigger yeah. deal. And, and, um, and as we've continued to grow, like we constantly have to sit down and make sure we're on the same page because, you know, 1% fracture can start to grow you away. So we have to get back on track yeah. and some of you grow further apart and we get back on track, further apart, back on track. And that's how we've been able to establish our partnership and maintain it for the better part of, you know, over 10 years because it allows us to make sure that we're on the same page and that we're both, we're both on the same objective. So it leads me to the last thing I'll say on, on what keeps you aligned is, are you mission centered? Um, the mission for us mm -hmm. has been to elevate the world's perception of the salon and spa industry. He lives, eats, breathes that. I live, eat, breathe that. And we both said that's what keeps us together as business owners is accomplishing that I mission. Love that. I love that. And like laying those foundational pieces of, yeah, like what, what kind of hearing your story is really great to hear about like how your relationship blossomed yep. and built and like, which is 
tells like having that experience is amazing to know even to have the bad experiences to go to really point out like this is what a relationship should look like. So we're going to take a commercial break. When we come back, we're going to talk about how to start that path of your, on your own um, for yourself and to start to build those relationships and make those connections and figure out, is this person I want to go into partnership with the right person for me? So stick around. We'll be right back. Are you ready to increase your retention and revenue and convert website traffic to clients? Then you're ready for Maya. Maya creates better business relationships by pairing the right clients with the right beauty professionals. Use promo code HPSA for your first two months free. Visit joinmaya.com to get started. We're Forest, born on the salon floor and built for and by hair and beauty professionals like you. Forest is your marketing, your reporting, your reputation management. You need one easy to use system that does it all. Forest, together we grow. Sustain Beauty Co. has two of the best tools to help you save water, time, and a bunch of money. Join the clean water salon movement with EcoHead's water saving shampoo nozzles and scrummy plant-based microfiber towels available at sustainbeauty.co are you tired of not knowing what your hair color is costing you with salon scale we take the guesswork out for you so you can cover your back bar expenses reduce your color waste and generate more profit in your salon click the link in the description to get 10 percent off your first year Welcome back to the Profitable Salon Owner Podcast. We have been talking about building partnerships, business partnerships in your salon, in your business, whatever you're whatever you're working in right now. We are talking about that. And it's been, we spent the first half kind of talking about Jason's experience, a lot of experience that he's had having multiple business partners and ones that went well and one that's going one that's going really well, ones that haven't gone well. And all of all of it to say is a lot of experience really points towards what works and what doesn't. And your partnerships are going to ebb and flow. You're going to have things come up. You can't avoid that. So I think it really comes down to how do you deal with those things as they come up and how do you find somebody that you work well enough that you guys can go through the hard together? Because let's be real, owning a business together is no piece of cake. So Jason, let's talk about what that means as like things, yeah. you know, as people mm. are starting to want to work on that, how do they start to open that door? Yeah. Well, I think it'd be good for us to talk about like, how do you start to open that door? But also if you're trying to bring on shareholders. I want to make sure we talk about that in the mm -hmm. second half as well, because especially in salons, like bring on shareholders is a topic that a lot of people are like, hey, I'd really like to do that. It starts to allow you to sell your business and get in a place that like maybe gives you a transition to a future plan. Uh, and I also want to talk about in the second half is agreements for a second. What agreements need to be in place for any partnership? And even if you're in one right now and you don't have these agreements, how do you put those in place uh, quickly so that you can... Um, uh, so that you can make sure that you you don't have as many issues. Because what I'll tell you is I've navigated more people out of business partnerships and I can tell you they join the academy. They're like, by the way, my partner and I don't get along. What the hell do we do? Like, that's a big deal. <laughs> so a couple things. Um, agreements and partnerships is number one, is one of the most important things. Um, one of the most important ones you can have is what's called the buy-sell agreement. <clears throat> and a lot okay. of people, you know, you plan for a partnership to last forever, but they, again, it's not a marriage. It's not designed to last for the rest of your life. It might only last for <laughs> five, 10, 15 years. And even marriages don't always last for the rest of your life. Right. So the idea is, is like when you have an agreement, what's your buy sell agreement? Uh, Doug and I created something called a, um, w w well for us, that's called a shotgun agreement, which basically means that if either one of us want to buy or sell at any point in the future and, and we want to exit the partnership that, um, if like, let's say I want to value the business at a hundred dollars and Doug's like, no, 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 it's worth $500. Clearly that's how much our business is worth either 100 or $500. <laughs> but like, let's say I say it's worth a hundred dollars and Doug says it's worth, and Doug says it's worth 500. Well, whatever I offer Doug, like if I say, Hey man, it's only worth a hundred bucks. I'll, I want to buy you out. So go away. And he goes, Jason, that's really, really cheap. Um, there's no way I would ever accept that. The other op option he could do is immediately buy me out in reverse for the same value I gave him. So he could he could make me go away for that hundred dollar value, right? Wow. So if like for example, if I said, "Hey Doug, I want to buy you out," and I go because normally it would work like this: "Hey Doug, I want to buy you out. Um, here's a hundred dollars," and he would be like, "No, no, no, it's worth five hundred dollars, Jason." Right? Well. I'd have to give him a. It's it's designed to give have me give him a very good offer if I wanted to buy him out. So because like Got let's it. say he wanted to buy me out and he goes, Jason, the the business is worth a hundred dollars and I'm like, no no no, it's worth five hundred. Same in reverse, I could I could just buy him out immediately. So that becomes mm -hmm. that conversation. Is the shotgun agreement is designed to give you a very solid offer for buying out the partner that's fair that makes sense. Um, we also mm -hmm. have a business broker. 
that we've helped other people use uh, to work with their business to buy them out. And like, we just always say like, look, one of the, you could put in your buy sell, like, Hey, we're going to work with a business broker, whatever they deem to be the value of the business is what we'll buy each other out for. And we're good. Like that's another way to do it is working through a broker or you can use your CPA or accountant can help you give you a business evaluation to give you a value of your company. And I know I'm, I'm talking about a weird subject, which is buying out your business partner in business partnerships because most people don't talk about this in the beginning because nobody's like, no, yeah. we're going to be friends forever, whatever the issue is, right? <laughs> That's going to right. go great. So what you got to have that agreement in place, even if it's only a handshake deal so that you know, and it's better in writing, obviously, but like, so that you know that there's an agreement for how does that work, right? Yeah. And and we've yeah. navigated this with other people. It's like, well, how do you resolve a dispute? I did mention earlier, that's another really, yeah. so one is the agreement. The other is how do you resolve disputes? If you don't agree on things, what do you do? So the way we work is that, and again, we've talked about this on podcast, Doug and I have talked about this on podcast. The way we work is if we can't work it out with each other, we go and get coaching on our own. Each one of us goes, gets coaching. And then if that coaching, we still can't work it out because we don't work on our own head trash. Cause like, what are we doing? That's screwing this whole thing up. And then if we can't do that, For we sure. have an agreed upon mediator that gets in between us that we get on the phone with and say, Hey man, we're not working this out. And like, we have a problem. And if we can work it out with a mediator, then great. We're still hanging out. And if we can't work it out with a mediator, then we exercise our shotgun agreement, mm. right? So it's like there's stages of how to work that out. And even if you're in a partnership that you're not happy with, you might want to put some rules for engagement because the problem is when emotions are high, intelligence is low. And when money's on the line, emotions are super high, right? And especially yeah. if you have a big company, like big company breakups could be a big deal. And, and again, I would say an order of importance for every company, it should be what's the most important thing for the clients that you serve? Those are the most important people. Second is, what are the employees that you have? Because without clients, you don't have employees, right? And without employees, you don't have clients. Completely. So like, what serves the client the best? What serves your team the best? And then the ownership, that's your own drama. That's for you and your partners and whatever else. Which leads me to, and the last little piece of this here, talking about shareholders. Yeah. If you're gonna bring on shareholders, like let's, let's say you have a partner, you don't have a partner, maybe you own 100%, maybe you own 50, it doesn't matter. But you start to say, I wanna bring on shareholders. Well, the idea would be, that those shareholders shouldn't just be people that give you money to start buying your business. Because I, I have witnessed this before where a company brought in a shareholder so they could make some cash. And that shareholder, because like the, the joke for business owners is that we you work a nine to five, you leave and start a business and you work from five to nine, right? You work 5 a.m. to 9 p.m. every day as a business owner. So I met this guy and he was a stylist in a salon. And uh, I don't think I watched this podcast so I can talk a little bit about him. But uh, he worked as a stylist <laughs> in a salon and he was like, I hate working for you, the owners. I hate them. They're horrible people. I don't like them at all. I think they run things terribly. And so this first opportunity he got to buy in as a shareholder, he's like, I want to buy in as shareholders so I can tell you guys what to do and not do because I'll be mm -hmm. an owner then. So his 5% of shares bought him a right to be at the table and tell the owners that they're idiots. Bad, bad wow. reason to bring on a shareholder. So as an yeah, owner, okay. what you want to do is you want to bring in shareholders. You're like, man, those people will, will help us. If I put them as an owner, they'll help us grow the company to a new level. And by adding them, my shares become more valuable. That's yeah. what you're doing. You're saying, I'm going to sell off a piece to make everything more valuable. That's what you're doing. And so if you're just bringing on shareholders because they happen to have the cash, bad, or they want a seat at the big boy table or the big girl table, right? Like they want a seat there, also not a good reason. Uh, and what you're ideally looking for is somebody that maybe in the future could buy you out completely. That's what you're looking for is like, hey, if I, if I said one day, and who knows, you know, that may be in my, in my future at some point, like, hey, I don't want to run this thing anymore. I'd like somebody else to do it. I also want somebody that like would buy in that the team would be like, hell yeah, I want to work for that person. Right. Yeah. Or that like, I, I love respect and cherish that person. And like, I want to be a part of what they're doing because they believe in the mission. They believe in the direction. They believe in all those things and want to get where we want to go. That's what you're looking for when you're bringing on shareholders is somebody else that the team ex is excited about, that your clients are excited about, that is going to run things even better and make your employees life better and the client's life better. Because I'll tell you, as a business owner, one of the worst things you can do is think that you will run your company forever. Hmm. Right. Because I know I've got certain skills that will kick this company so far. And one of these days, somebody else will probably be running it. It's fine. It's what it will happen at some point. Right. But the idea is, is that they should be able to take it further than I could. And that's For what sure. it should be.
And that's what you, that's what you're looking for in a shareholder. Somebody who can help in the future, take it further than you can. So what I'm hearing you say is like, just be, don't be motivated by the money part of it. Like, Oh, I need more money or I need to pay more. Or I need some cash. I want to buy a house. So let me share off some, (laughs) let me cut off some shares so I can go buy a house. Like it should be motivated by what's in the best interest of the business. Like we're mission first, uh, team second, individual third. So mission of the business, serve our clients and do the things that we need to do. Secondarily, take care of the team. And then I've got to be third on that list. And by the way, Doug and I both subscribe to that is like our needs are the last on the list. Mm. Client needs first, team needs second, we're last. We're the ones who forgo paychecks if we have to, to make sure the team gets paid. You know, like that's what it should be. Now, don't live in that spot forever. If you're in that spot and you've been running your company for 10 years, you should probably call us. We'll fix the problem. But like that's what it should be. You know, is it when, when there's a risk or an issue or a problem, you solve it first with your own because no. you want to bring on people if you're going to expand your business. Because bringing on shareholders, having partners, it's it's in a point to expand your yep. business. You want people who have as much passion and drive for 100%. your mission and want to expand your business more and not just get caught up in what the money is. Speaking of money, I know that a lot of people in com- in questions that they've asked us about shareholders, business partners, is the confusion with pay and who gets paid. Oh, dang. You just That's said, like, the you worst. You and Doug have the, same, have the same agreement of like, yeah, you guys yeah. you guys abide by the same rules. So let's talk a little bit about paying each other yes. or paying – like how do you start to build yeah. So this is dangerous, okay, is that you, you – if you don't have profit from your business, you don't really – well, this, I would say in general, if you don't have profit in your company, you, when you bring on shareholders at that phase, that's really scary. Because like, if I just said, hey, Kayla, I'm not making any profit, but give me whatever thousands of dollars – and then you'll be invested in the company and one day maybe you'll make profit. I've seen that happen where it's like somebody shells out 20 grand and they're like, they never get anything for their 20 grand. That's super dicey, right? So, um, and you're like, well, cool. You can now say you're an owner, but what does that mean? What's the benefit? So this is really important. Just being a shareholder doesn't mean you make money. You want to find out. And if you're watching this, you're like, maybe I'd like to be a shareholder in a salon. You want to find out like, what is that? Like if, if I sold you 1% of this company, how much does that mean you make every quarter? So the way our business mm-hmm. works is as owners, we get quarterly payouts. Okay. So as an owner, there's a quarterly payout that happens. That's like, if we're making money, we get some level of payout. But as an owner, I also get a paycheck for the work that I do. Like if I'm acting CEO, which I am in the company, I'm acting CEO, I have a CEO pay for, the, for what I do. If I'm doing work that requires my own physical effort, then I do that. Now you could be a silent shareholder, just like when you invest in stocks in the uh, stock market, is that like, yeah. hey, I put in money and it, it somewhat, some, maybe it pays me something, maybe it doesn't, maybe I just buy and hold it forever or whatever that is. But as a silent partner and you're not involved. But I think this is what happens. Some people go, well, you're a shareholder now. Like if I made you a shareholder, Kayla, and all of a sudden I'm like, cool, that means you'll work extra hard for free for me all the time. Doesn't necessarily mean that just because you're a shareholder. You can be a silent shareholder and not be involved in more of the day to day. Or if I'm going to say, hey, I want to make you a shareholder and I'm going to give you another leadership position, I got to make sure that I'm paying you for that leadership position. And I think a lot of people is like, oh, I want to bring on a manager in my salon, but I don't have any money. I'll make them a shareholder and I'll make them buy into the company. And now you're going to be a manager for free for me because you're now an owner. The problem is most owners, when they started, they were their first free employees. And so they think that every shareholder now needs to be a free employee. That's not really how that works. Uh, You want to make sure they're getting paid for the work they're doing. Unlike me, like just like me, there's a great book on that. Um, Profit First actually talks about different levels of pay. There's profit pay. There's owner's compensation, which is for the work that you do. And then there's other duties and responsibilities. So if you're a salon or you should be paying yourself for the service provider income, the owner's compensation, which is probably your owner and manager income, as well as a profit distribution. And then that'll probably put you in a good spot. But I would say if you're not profitable, get profitable before you start talking about shareholders. Because why, I mean, again, you're just convincing somebody to buy into a vision of the future, which you can do. It's just not my favorite thing. Yeah, because it's a lot of like you're then you're playing with other people's lives too, yeah. and then it's and, like, and remember, here's into. what I would say: no, not everybody is owner material. I, I'll tell you here. I'll yeah. leave you on this question, Kayla. Nice. I had somebody on my team that was I was talking about shareholders, and they were like, "I'd really love to be a shareholder." They don't work for us anymore. This person said, "I really want to be a shareholder," and I said, "Great." So here's how this works as a shareholder: um, you get paid every quarter uh, if we make money. If we don't make money, you don't get paid every quarter. And if we have a hiccup or an issue in the business, we all put up money uh, compared to how much ownership percentage that we have. So if we have to put up $100 or $100,000, if you're a 10% owner, you got to cough up 10 grand in the business. And this person was like, oh my God, I would never do that. 
I would never put money into the business that I'm like, then I don't ever want you as a shareholder yeah. because yes, you share in it, the deal is you share in the risk and you share in the yep. reward. If you're only interested in the reward, that is not the time to be a shareholder. That's my, no. that's my wow. final good, <laughs> good mic drop. That that's was a it. good, good point. Cause I think, so if you're listening to this, I want to really recap to really focus on understand why you're looking for, like you're wanting to start yeah. a business, what are you doing? Have very clear agreements, know exactly and, and figure out what that looks like for you. What are they coming in as? What responsibilities do you have? Get really clear on what it looks like before you even start. And to be honest, like we can't go through everything in 30 minutes and your situation's all going to be all going to be unique. So if you want support and your partnerships, if you're in a 50, 50 and you're like, Oh, Jason said, no, don't do that. And you want support. <laughs> I'm going to put a number in the description. You can text um, uh, partnership into the text number and then we can support you with your particular nice. situation. But get clear agreements and figure out what your why. Get clear agreements and understand all of those things and get support. Have have somebody who if you if you if something does go wrong, have somebody you guys can both turn to that you trust and get really clear on what it is that you are doing before you kind of jump in. Because the worst thing is to get a year, two years, three years down the road to be like, oh, I made a big mistake. How do I get out of this? Because that's no bueno. Crazy. Well, thank you for hanging out with us today. Hopefully you got some value out of it. Text that number if you want any support, if you have any questions. Um, and then we will get back to you. So thank you for hanging out with us. And Jason, thank you for hanging out with me and being on here. I always love having love you. Love dropping Your some wisdom. Your vast knowledge Let's is amazing. I know. We had no love punches today. Uh, it's kind of all a love punch. It was you, one big will, love punch on partnerships. Love big love punch. <laughs> there you go. Well, thank you for hanging out with us. We'll see you next time on the Profitable Slaughter Podcast. You've been listening to the Profitable Salon Owner Podcast. Be sure to like, subscribe, leave us a review, and check us out at ProfitableSalon.com for more episodes, content, and to help you turn your salon into the business you've always dreamt of.